Hi everybody, greetings from a not too unpleasant day here in Cape Town. It's a bit hot, uh, we've had some rain and that's cooled the place down a little. So yeah, it, it's okay. Did you like the music on the opening credits? Uh, it's a regimental march. Um, I just uh, put it on there to commemorate the affiliation that the Rhodesia Regiment had uh, going over a period of two world wars with the King's Royal Rifle Corps. Uh, they today, of course, um, are the British Rifles Regiment. And um, I put it on there because Christmas is a very important time to them uh, traditionally. And so um, we wish our uh, former comrades, brothers in arms, um, a Merry Christmas. I was, uh, uh, you know, talking about Christmas, I was just listening to, to John Edmund, uh, a song of his called Trooper Thomas. And uh, you, you should listen to it if you, if you haven't pretty catchy little tune uh, a bit of a historical song and he talks about a, a BSAP trooper who um, has been uh, sent to deliver mail and he sets off on two horses well you, you listen to the song um, and it made me think of, uh, of another uh, BSAP member uh, that I knew during the course of the Rhodesian Bush War uh, on a similar mission <laughs> but not mounted and not having to face uh, wild animals in the bush at all. Now I'll tell you what it was about. Um, you know, our postal service in the, in the Rhodesian Army worked exceptionally well. So well that I think we all are guilty of taking it for granted. And so today we can't even explain to you how it was organized. It, it just worked. Uh, my wife would write a letter and a few days later it didn't seem to matter in what remote part of the country I happened to find myself in, somehow uh, the letter would, uh, would find me there. And, and likewise the other way around, I'd write a letter and uh, you know, not very, very long afterwards uh, she would receive it. Um, uh, you know, uh, what would happen is that um, the lieutenant would say something like, you know, there's a truck leaving for, uh, for company HQ, is there any mail? guys if you got mail get it together and so we'd hand the letters over to uh, to him and he'd give it to the driver and the truck would set off and you know this would happen uh, from time to time <clears throat> I presume the truck arrives at uh, company HQ from there it'll you know be put on another vehicle that happened to be going to Salisbury to battalion HQ and there the mail presumably would end up there what happens then I, c I can only guess that the whole bag of letters is just taken down to the Brayside police station, uh, Brayside uh, post office and, uh, and, and left there and just delivered by the civvy uh, system in the normal course of events. I, I think that's what happened. But there was a special branch detective who worked with us for a while and uh, you know he was not restricted to uh, in his movements. And so he'd very often pop in there at the platoon base, uh, have a, a, a cup of tea with a with a lieutenant, you know, exchange uh, pleasantries of the day, and then uh, we'd we'd be told if you guys have got any mail, uh, give it to him. Uh, he's go uh, he's going off soon. Now whether he would go straight to Salisbury or whether he I don't know, but he he seemed to to be able to shortcut the system just a little bit. Not that it made an awful lot of difference really, but, um, but we all got to know him. And he was a very nice guy, I have to tell you. A very pleasant man, very accommodating, quiet guy, a, a sort of a tallish chap with, uh, with blonde hair as I remember him. I cannot recall his name. And I have tried to think of what his name is, but it, it just escapes me. <clears throat> At any rate, I come back from a, a follow-up on one occasion and, uh, you know, you sometimes sense if things are a, a little bit unsettled in, in, the, in the platoon base and it, it seemed to me there was something hanging in the air but I didn't, um, didn't say anything, got myself sorted out, cleaned up a little bit. Then I went over to the lieutenant to go and say hello to him and see how he was and so on. and. Um, I said to him, uh, where's the SB guy? Has he been around yet? And he said, man, I've got some bad news for you. Uh, he's dead. He's dead? 
Well, you know, we're in the middle of a bush war and, you know, people do die. And I thought to myself, well, must have hit a landmine. Uh, that would be the most um, logical explanation that I would come up with. And um, he said, um, yeah, he was killed by one of our blokes. I said, one of our blokes? He said, yes, uh, one of our black soldiers. Now that call-up was the first call-up that we had black troops with us. Prior to that, um, like the RLI, like the SAS, the Rhodesia Regiment was an all-white unit. But then, you know, circumstances demanded that that we uh, integrate um, black troops into the regiment, simply because we did not have enough white soldiers. Um, the war was hotting up. The areas we had to cover were bigger. The number of uh, eligible white soldiers uh, was getting smaller and smaller as folk left the country. So it was something that, that nobody could avoid. It had to happen. But I, I have to tell you that in all honesty, and it wasn't a racial thing, I think it was just that, you know, I felt, well, you know, we sh somehow we should try and cope. I mean, we, you know, this is the regiment and this is part of its, its, uh, its history. Um, but nonetheless, um, for myself personally, I accepted the, the presence of the black troops there amongst us. And um, in time, I, I found no problems whatsoever. But at, at that moment, at that time, when I heard that one of our black uh, soldiers had killed this uh, special branch detective, uh, I must say I was very unhappy. And I, I expressed my unhappiness at this. And the lieutenant just sat there uh, very calmly and then he informed me that, well, it wasn't the black guy's fault. The um, SB man had wandered away from camp uh, when he returned, he was challenged by the sentry and he made no reply and uh, so he lost his life. And when I heard that, immediately my mood changed and I thought back to some years prior to the Rhodesian Bush War, to something that happened, uh, an experience that I had, which uh, made me understand the situation a lot clearer. Uh, way back, <clears throat> in fact it would be at the um, sort of in the early part of 63. Now uh, any of you who were members at that time of uh, one RRR uh, and the RLI would probably remember this incident. <coughs> uh, uh, the army had decided in its wisdom that it was time to have a very big exercise and so this whole thing was planned for <laughs> for a weekend and uh, it, it was to take place along the banks of some certain river which <laughs> escapes me now and you know it, it was a very very big big undertaking involving the whole of um, the first battalion uh, Royal Rhodesia Regiment and I don't know uh, what elements of the Rhodesian Light Infantry but at any rate uh, RLI were the enemy and um, uh, the stage was set for this this big confrontation. Well, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to make a long story out of it, <laughs> except to say it ended up in a mess up of epic proportions. You couldn't believe everything that went wrong. <laughs> and I think on both sides uh, of the conflict, uh, the pretend conflict, <laughs> a lot was lacking, uh, to say the least. <clears throat> And so that particular weekend ended. <laughs> it's terrible, really shocking when I think back on it. And and of course, naturally, the high command of the army didn't find it amusing. They weren't chuckling as I am, and uh, they decided that that the army needed jacking up. So after a while, uh, we were informed that there would be a special camp, and uh, we would we would jolly well make it every endeavor to ensure that we were present, that um, no absentees would be tolerated. Now in those days, you know, 
<laughs> the method of the army was, you know, if you wanted greater efficiency out of your men, <clears throat> you just yelled and screamed and, and went hysterical and ran them around the place. And somehow this brought out the best of them and, and overcame any sort of deficiencies that they had. And uh, we duly reported at uh, the battalion HQ, which happened to be the drill hall in Salisbury. And we were loaded on trucks and taken to Cleveland Range. And uh, when we got there, oh, the nonsense started. It, uh, we were yelled at and we were ran this way and we were run that way. And even our platoon commander, a man who's normally, you know, sort of well composed and in control of himself uh, had a certain amount of dignity and we all respected him for that even he behaved like a I don't know <laughs> hurling insults at people that were uncalled for until we all looked at this and thought man we're in for the high jump here you know it seems like these leaders have all been told you know you better better sort your men out and so <clears throat> Yeah, Saturday began on the range, uh, qualifying, and then thereafter, something that I've never seen before. We, uh, we all had to boil our rifles. Never saw that before, never saw it since. And we had in those days SLRs. So there were these big 44-gallon drums with the lids cut off, you know, the tops cut off, and they were standing on, on open fires, and they'd been boiling there, well, I don't know, for a few hours, and we had to stick our our gun barrels down there and take ladles pour this down the the barrels and uh, you know clean the thing up properly and then re-oil it and assemble it so that uh, was all done to the accompaniment of shouting and screaming and uh, while we're doing that we can see uh, a couple of Land Rovers coming up the drag uh, and they would stop at uh, <laughs> the the 400 yard mark where somebody had placed a table with chairs and a number of officers sat there and so uh, these Land Rovers uh, manned by the millet, by the um, regimental police would stop there with their, their cargo of uh, unhappy defaulters and um, they would appear before these men sitting there and explain why, <laughs> why they had missed the parade so uh, we could see this going on. One, one, one of the men that they manhandled out of the Land Rover uh, was actually dressed in pajamas. And, and I heard that this fellow was sort of like on permanent night shift and he had just come home from work and was sleeping when they knocked on his door and wouldn't even give him time to get dressed. They just dragged him off to, to Cleveland Range. And so there he was for orders. Now, <laughs> I... Uh, uh, you know, I've been up for orders for myself for that kind of infringement. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say, and and generally that would end up, you know, like if I can remember correctly, in those days it would be a, a five-pound fine that you'd have to pay to the adjutant, and you were given something like I don't know, 14 days to to settle that debt. But this was different on this occasion. They these people were after they'd been up there for orders, they were put back in the Land Rovers and carted off. <laughs> they didn't come and join us. So they were taken off somewhere, I don't know where they could have been taken and stuck in a cell somewhere for the rest of the weekend. Uh, and then when all the rifles had been cleaned up, <coughs> we were doubled over to the 200 yard mark. And there we had to sit in a circle like little children uh, around an instructor. Well, that's okay. You know, the, the army does that kind of thing. There's, there's no problem. We, we sit down there. Now, this guy, who's the instructor, <coughs> I'd never seen him before. Uh, but I knew he was a territorial uh, sergeant because he had these three big uh, red stripes on his on his uh, uniform. So he's, he's, he watches us when we all settle down and then he starts. And I mean, he's got a loud mouth and he's an opinionated, opinionated guy. Eh? And he's walking around with this SLR, the butt stuck in his in the hip like this. And, and, and he's a real big deal. He's, he's strutting around and, he, and he's, you know, <clears throat> he starts talking about all the specs for this, uh, this weapon. The muzzle velocity, um, uh, how many rounds it can fire on semi, because of course the SLR doesn't fire automatic. 
um, all the other sort of specs. And the sort of stuff, it, it's, it's not very interesting to me personally. I, you know, I mean, as long as the thing works and it does its job, that's all that counts to me. Um, but this man, you know, obviously he thought that this information was very important and it had to, we had to take it in. So he would spin on his heel every now and then as he walked around with this weapon and point his finger at some unfortunate soldier and say, what did I just tell you? What's the range of this weapon? And, and, and this guy would have to try and remember what, what he had heard. And if you could not remember, uh, you were, you know, you were berated and you might double down to the butts and back again. Uh, and so this was <laughs> quite a, it's quite a, a tense time, you know, he trying to concentrate and listen to what the man's saying. He's walking around, he's got his back to you, you can't hear the words clearly unless he's facing you. And, um, and there's all this technical stuff going on there. So there's a, a, a soldier sitting next to me. <clears throat> the sergeant spins around, points his finger at him and said, what are you doing with that weapon? And the man says, sorry, Sarge, get up on your feet. Get up on your feet when I, when I talk to you. So the chap stands up to attention. <clears throat> Sarge comes over, grabs the weapon and uh, very dramatically um, takes off the empty magazine, cocks it, looks inside, makes the weapon safe again, gives it to him and, sit, and turns to the rest of us and says, nobody, nobody cocks a weapon behind my back. Do you hear me? The next time I hear any movement from you guys, you're all going to be sorry. Do you understand that, you miserable bunch? And he's, he's talking like this. And the guy next to me says, I'm sorry, I, d I, d I didn't do anything. I didn't, I, he said, shut up, shut up. You want to you spend the rest of the weekend in the target shed? So of course, the guy keeps quiet. Sit down. So, you know, <clears throat> we had um, instructors in the form of staff sergeants at Llewellyn. And um, they could also be quite abrasive. But I mean, that was just part of their job. They yell and scream and shout and it goes in one ear and out the other. You pay no attention. There's nothing personal about it. Um, when you stop for a smoke break, you know, you're all almost buddies, although, you know, he is a staff sergeant and you're a rifleman. But, um, but nonetheless, there's no hard feelings. But with this individual, there was definitely something wrong. There was some personality disorder there and it came through very, very strongly. So we endured this for the rest of the, the rest of the Saturday afternoon. Very unpleasant having this man near us. <coughs> anyway, uh, we have dinner and the camp settles down and I'm placed on sentry duty. And I'm on from 10 till 12. Two hours on, four hours off. So I start my stint at that time. And I'm, I'm put on the drag which runs down the side of the, the range. Those of you who remember Cleveland Range will know exactly what I'm talking about. So in the distance at the, I think a thousand, round, a thousand um, yard mark, round about there, I think that was the length of that range, <coughs> there was a gate leading onto a drag which Todd Road it came from Salisbury. So it's, it's dark, it's quiet, <coughs> the camp is slumbering. Uh, but it's not so dark that you can't see your hand in front of your face. I mean, there are stars out and so you've got starlight and your eyes are accustomed to the dark. You, you, can, you can see kind of okay. And then, of course, the road is also, you know, stands out. It's a <coughs> sand road. It's, it's very, very, um, very visible. And uh, I see lights coming from the direction of Salisbury. It's a motor vehicle slows down and it turns in at the gate and it starts proceeding toward me. So I'm, I'm watching all this and it, it stops about halfway between myself and the gate and it does a three-point turn and I hear the doors open and I hear voices. I, d I can't hear the words because they're too far away but I can, I can gather that it's somebody saying goodbye to somebody else. And then the car drives off 
<coughs> takes a left at the gate and goes back to Salisbury. And two figures come walking up the, the road toward me. So I, I look at this lot and I know that the whole object of this camp here is to make soldiers of us. So I can't just, um, you know, sort of melt into the shadows and let them go by. I don't know who's watching me. I'd find myself on a quick charge if I did something like that. So at the risk of waking up everybody, uh, I, I challenge these men when they, be, when they come close enough. Halt! Who goes there? And I hold this SLR with a bayonet on the end of it out in front of me. <coughs> That's the sort of thing we used to do in those days. Now, when the man opens his voice, one of them, to talk to me, I recognize him immediately. It's uh, Sergeant Brainless from Weapon Training. And, and all he's got to say is, I'm Sarge so-and-so and I'm coming back to camp. I don't know what he's doing out of camp in any case. But no, he, he's not going to do that. <clears throat> he starts yelling at me, screaming at me. Now this 5RR is a, is a very polite channel. Uh, we don't repeat um, swear words here uh, that are too bad. So I can't, you know, I can't tell you what this man said exactly. I, I can, but, but I won't. He was extremely aggressive angry, enraged, and uh, the worst language that you could hear poured forth from his mouth. Um, who did I think I was? Uh, stand to attention, and uh, if I point that weapon at him for one minute longer, he'll take it from me and show me what he, will, what he can do with it. Well, that's, not, that, that's no good. I mean, <clears throat> he's creating a scene here now, at the top of his voice. It's enough to wake up the dead. And um, I can't leave it at that, so I, I, I challenge him again. Halt! Who goes there? Now, there's a question. Who goes there? You identify yourself. That's what it means. It doesn't mean anything else. It doesn't mean I must identify him. The onus is not on me. He's got to reply. He's got to. That's the theory of it. <clears throat> but he doesn't. He takes a step toward me, and I can see you know he's, he's had a bit to drink clearly but he's, he's not that drunk that he's uh, he's hopeless on his feet the man beside him is quiet doesn't say a word but he's shifting uneasily from foot to foot I can see that so I'm guessing to myself this must be some officer buddy of his otherwise how would he have got out of the camp over here to go off drinking in Salisbury and and this man ought to intervene and say, uh, listen, uh, you know, soldier's just doing his duty, you know, just you know, do your part. Uh, but this guy's keeping quiet. So, he, I can see that he wants to take me on. He's, he's positioning himself and he's, he's going to pounce. He wants to lunge, he wants to grab the weapon. And, um, and I can't have that. There's no ways. No ways under the sun. I'm not going to be humiliated like that. And uh, what's going to happen? In the morning, I'm going to be up for orders. The whole battalion is scattered around me here. Yeah? Uh, every one of them must know that the sentry was disarmed by this man. What a useless sentry. Oh, no, I'm not going to have that. No ways. And, uh, and I know I'm fully within my rights. This man cannot do what he's doing. So I step back, but I can't step back too far. And besides, as I noticed, as I step back, just so that he can't grab at the weapon, uh, this sort of encouraged him to come forward a bit more. So I told him the third time, halt. And uh, all it did was just make him angrier. And I'm, I'm getting quite desperate now because nobody is, is coming to my assistance. The MM, MMG lines are, yeah, 50 paces away from me. Beyond that is my own lines, headquarter company. There they are. And uh, scattered around there must be another three or four rifle companies. I don't know how many men are there, plus all the support elements. There's hundreds of men there in the dark. 
and they can't all be fast asleep. Somebody must be awake. Some officer to get up, get up from underneath his blankets, come and see what's going on there and defuse the situation. Nobody moves. A whole lot of them leave me to deal with this man by himself. And this guy wants to take me on. I can see he's, he's, he's itching for it. He, can, he wants to grab that weapon. So everything is hanging in the balance. It's my sense of duty and it's his life. It, it, there's nothing else at stake here. He, he's either going to live or he's going to die. If he responds, he's going to live. If he does what he's supposed to do, tell me who he is. <laughs> but if he doesn't and he tries to grab that weapon, I'm going to stick the bayonet right in him. And I'm, I'm prepared to do it. And I've already, I've already realized that the minute I sink that bayonet into his stomach, he's instinctively, you know, he's just going to grab at the weapon. And I didn't want that. So I knew it would be a quick lunge, in with the bayonet, quick back, out of, out of, out of his grasp, if I could. And what would have happened? He would either be dead or maimed for life. But where would that leave me? <clears throat> you know, um, this is peacetime. There's no war on. There's no, no enemy trying to overthrow the state. And um, the, the army certainly would not be uh, entitled to deal with a, with a case like that. That would be something that the civil authorities would deal with. The minute I stab that man and he collapses there in the sand, within half an hour there'll be a couple of B cars over there come to fetch me. The weapon would be taken as evidence. I'll be down to Salisbury Charge Office. Culpable homicide uh, is what uh, I would have to explain. And in the first instance I'd appear before a magistrate and I can just imagine the kind of questioning. <coughs> Did I recognize this man as he walked toward me? Yes, Your Worship. Who is he? So, a weapon training instructor. In your opinion, did you think he'd been drinking perhaps? Yeah, I do believe that. So, he has a man that you know who he is. You know he's not fully in control of his senses. And yet you take his life. Can you explain that to the court? You know, that's the sort of thing that I'm facing. I'm sure that there would be a lot of army officers <coughs> who would have applauded my action. Um, but there were others that would have, oh man, all this publicity, it's in the newspapers. Can't you think for yourself? So these are the thoughts that are going through my mind, like in, in seconds, you know. But, uh, but, but more importantly, what I'm thinking of is his family. <clears throat> Surely he's got loved ones, assuming that somebody could love this guy. His never wife, kids maybe. There they're sitting without without him in the home uh, because of, of the situation and I thought I'm going to have to decide this any moment now because he's, he's going to go for me. So I <coughs> I just um, order arms and um, said sorry sergeant I didn't recognize you for a moment please pass. But the words were sticking in my throat I tell you I was so angry that I'd been placed in this emotional uh, situation that was it was really sheer hell for me for a few for a few moments and uh, that didn't stop him but uh, it calmed him down a little bit and uh, with further threats that if there was any more trouble from me yeah you guessed it I would end up in the target shed and uh, his buddy whoever he was the mysterious faceless man um, steered him off to wherever the, the bivvy was to settle down for the night. So I was relieved a little bit later and I went, went lay down. I never slept that night. I was really very, very upset. And uh, you know, it's one of those things that has stuck with me for all these years. I mean, how many times thereafter, countless times, that we'd go down to Cleveland Range um, prior to mobilizing, you know, for bush duty. And I'd look at that target shed and I'd think of that man, you know, and I'd be so upset with him to think that he wanted to lock me up in that target shed and, and take that weapon off me. <laughs> you know, the next morning, 
uh, some of us were sent out and I was uh, a member of that party, go and pick up doppies, go and find all the, the spent cartridge cases, as many as you can, and you know, these things were gathered up. Uh, by the time we got back, you know, the trucks had been loaded, you know, climbed on the back of the trucks. And I sat there and then I saw him <clears throat> come walking across to talk to our platoon commander. And I just looked him in the face like that. He looked at me, but he looked away. And part of me said, come on, just get off the truck and go and have this out with him. And, and another part of me said, look, just leave it. Just leave it, leave it, leave it where it is. Now, <clears throat> friends, the Rhodesian community was a very small community, okay? And our army was very small. And, um, and we're all interested in things related to our country. And that's why this channel has a, a reasonable following. Because Rhodesians, you know, they like to... They, they like this sort of thing, you know, they, they, they want to hear about things that happened in their country. And so there's every possibility if that gentleman uh, is alive, uh, that he may even be watching this movie. So I, I just want to say to him, <clears throat> you know who you are. And I hope that your ears are burning, okay, because you really acted like an idiot that night. I hope you're alive, and uh, I hope you've, uh, you've not wasted the life that you were given, because you nearly, nearly lost it that night. So uh, a Merry Christmas to you, uh, friend, and uh, just count your lucky stars, eh? So you know, I, 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 can, I can actually stop here now, I think I've said enough, but A, it's Christmas. If, if, you, if you're tired of hearing me, just, just switch off now. All right, okay. But let's make it a bumper edition, okay. Um, <laughs> I get back to work the next day. And uh, I work with a Greek by the name of uh, Nick. A lovely guy. Also ex-serviceman, but not Rhodesian, okay. He's, he's from the Greek army. He's got a mangled hand, injury he received uh, while he was uh, fighting in, in, in um, Cyprus. Nicosia, places like that, and he would tell me about the things that happened there. Now, Nick was always very interested to know what was, uh, what was going on, you know, when I've been away on a camp, and he'd listen intently. So I, I told him the story about this man and me being on guard duty, uh, uh, as I have told you now. And Nick says, you know, when we were in Nicosia, uh, we were in a house and there was a path from the house, he said, eight of us. There was a path from the house leading to a, an observation point. And during the day, we would man that and watch the countryside. And at night, we would put a sentry there. And he said, my friend went out on guard duty and he fell asleep. And our officer, the rest of us were in the room there. Our officer got up and went there. And then he came back later and he said, I was lying in my bed and I saw him come in through the door with the rifle bolt in his hand. Now, I don't know what weapons the Greek army had. Maybe it was the Enfield uh, um, SMLE. Uh, I don't know. Um, but what, at any rate, there was this bolt. So he says to those who are awake who have seen him walking in with it, he says, I want to see what your friend is going to tell me when he comes back here later. And he puts it in a drawer of the desk. Then he picks up a newspaper and he goes to the bathroom at the back. So Nick thinks to himself, man, this is the only chance I've got. My mate's going to be in big trouble. So uh, he jumps out of bed, opens the drawer, grabs the bolt, closes the drawer, out the door, doubles down the path, gets to his buddy, who's still asleep, unaware that somebody has come and removed the bolt from the rifle. Nick puts the bolt back in, wakes him up, tells him, listen, I can't st st stay here to explain anything to you. When you get back to the, to the house, you, you're just going to have to, you know, invent a story as you go along. But don't you dare tell, tell the, the officer that I brought your bolt back here. And don't go to sleep again. Wake up and stay awake now. And, and he doubles back and gets into bed. <clears throat> Officer comes out of the bathroom, 
puts a newspaper on the on the desk and then and then he walks out the house so not good and they wait and they wait and it's silence and then after a while bah, one shot man down and uh, what's happened is he's walked back to the guard he knows the sentry's got no bolt in his rifle he's challenged he doesn't answer because he's also a big deal but what happens sentry doesn't know who it is fires the shot kills the man so yeah Nick said it was a, a an awful thing but uh, they all kept quiet nobody said a word there was an inquiry to try to find out what the circumstances were why was this officer uh, not answer when he was challenged they never never found out nobody ever heard that the bolt was missing and that it was returned just left it like that yeah Nick made a name for himself you know <clears throat> he um, he was in a restaurant when somebody threw a grenade in there I, I, I'm, I might be mistaken but I think it was called the Criterion Grill and that would be somewhere on the south side between uh, First Street and Angua Street and it was either Speak Avenue or Stanley Avenue yeah somebody threw a grenade in there Nick was there and, and, and his old military instincts that he still had from the Greek army, hey, all those years ago, sprung into action. And uh, there was no time to bend down and pick up this grenade. He kicked at it like a football. And, uh, and he, did, he did move at some distance before it went off. Uh, and, and, and he was injured. Shame. But uh, he wasn't killed, but, but he was a hero as well. So, yeah, Nick was a great guy. Look, um, <clears throat> yeah, a little bit of a depressing note for Christmas I think eh? Um, <laughs> but um, you know the lesson is there and I think I've touched on it before those of you who are servicemen be very careful never ever disregard your sentries they are the most dangerous people you can meet armed God if he tells you halt he challenges you do whatever the protocol is in your unit uh, don't try and be clever no matter what rank you got it, it's not worth it and if you're a sentry keep your wits about you stay focused on what you're doing yeah it's the season to be merry <clears throat> there's not many of us that are merry here in South Africa I must say boy you know we seem to have uh, load shedding that's what they call it there's another word for power failure just goes on all the time all day every day then the power's off then the power's on then the power's off and so on a few days ago 15 hours the electricity was off here in the factory 15 hours that's a lot eh? when you think of it um, and I'm really really struggling I don't know when I last spent a night in my own bed in my own home honestly uh, I'm not kidding I, I stay here at the factory I live here at the factory I sleep here at the factory I have to when the power goes off if it's during the day we all keep busy here there's enough light coming in through the windows in the roof do whatever finishing work we have to do if it's night time power goes off it's pitch black nothing we can do we sit and doze two hours two and a half hours sometimes four hours four and a half hours before the power comes on it's another half hour at least say 45 minutes before the machines are hot enough to run again you know soon they get them running they, everything is working power goes off again it's uh, it, it's an absolute shambles it's not a joke everything is falling to pieces over here and we're just trying to do the best that we can so this is this has kind of kept me away from the movie making side of things you know it's uh, it's, it's quite um, debilitating you know to deal with this uh, all the time uh, besides which since I made the last movie I, I ended up with COVID myself um, no, it's not so bad in my case I, I have to say uh, you know the worst was just lying there in isolation you know days going by and I'm not allowed to be with other people 
and, uh, and there's a factory that needs me there. Oh, that was awful. But that was just, um, you know, emotional <laughs> hang-ups. That was, uh, there was nothing physical. Um, but I'm okay. I think I've, I've recovered from it. I hope. Um, and yeah, and the last movie we made was with Dr. Jameson, eh? And he's still waiting there at the border at Pizzani, waiting for us to join him so that we can cross over into the Transvaal and uh, share that adventure. So, yeah, I'm hoping that we'll get onto that quite soon. Friends, a uh, year has gone by. I hope it has it's been a good year for you. I hope that, yeah, there's, <laughs> every life has got troubles, you know, ups and downs. But I hope that the ups have outweighed the downs. So, um, a, a very Merry Christmas from me to all of you. Uh, I wish you well. I thank you for your support, as I always do. Uh, you know, really, uh, I'm overwhelmed uh, very often by uh, the generosity that, uh, that subscribers have shown and the interest that they've shown in my country. Um, I appreciate all of that. So uh, take care wherever you are, uh, look after yourself, and uh, we'll be together again in the new year. So uh, God bless now, eh? Bye.